Hi guys, it is a beautiful night, late summer night here in the Finger Lakes of upstate New York here in the closing days of summer 2019, but we're going to go all the way to the other side of the world. We're going to go way down under to Canberra, Australia, where it is actually surprisingly to me a snowy evening, I understand. And tonight I have the great pleasure and honor of having our second conversation in about the past six months with Julian Cribb, who has uh, <clears throat> been so kind as to agree to come back and pick up the conversation where we, uh, kind of where we left off uh, with our interview from, from last spring. And if you did not listen to that interview last spring with Julian Cribb, it would really help to, to, to add that to this. But anyway, be sure before or after you listen to this, this interview, listen to that one, and it will set the stage for this one. But to, just to pique your uh, curiosity, if you do not know Julian, or to remind you who Julian is, Julian Cribb is an Australian author and science communicator. His career includes appointments as scientific editor for the Australian newspaper, director of national awareness for the Australian Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. He's the editor of several newspapers, member of numerous scientific boards and advisory panels, and president of National Professional Bodies for Agricultural Journalism and Science Communication, which is what we're here to talk about today. His published work includes over 9,000 articles, 3,000 science media releases, and 10 books. His previous books include The Coming Famine, Poisoned Planet, and what was we were talked about mostly in our last interview, his last book, Surviving the 21st Century. As a science writer and a grandparent, Julian Cribb is deeply concerned at the existential emergency facing humanity, the mounting scientific evidence for it, and the deficit of clear thinking about how to overcome it. And now, uh, Julian is, is happy to announce the release of his brand new book titled Food or War, Food and Conflict, Past, Present, and Future, and Its Solution. Just real quickly, Food or War from Cambridge University Press, which should be coming out this week, presents compelling evidence that the world each urgently needs to rethink the present global food system or face the risk of spreading conflict and mass migration crises triggered by rising disputes over food, land, and water. In short, it argues we have a choice before us between food or war. So Julian Cribb, come back on to Collapse Chronicles and say hi to the folks, and then we're going to just dive right into the choice before us. Thank you, Sam. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, well, we're going to take, we have so much to cover here, uh, guys. So let's take just real quickly, uh, Julian, take a, just bring us up to date on uh just how humans have been fighting over food and resources for the past 17,000 years. What has gotten us to the point we are in today? Well, basically, we've always fought over food and the means of producing it. If you think about what a modern nation is, it's a series of borders or boundaries which enclose your food producing resources that you don't want other nations to have. So you defend those borders with your armies and things like that. Um, we've been fighting, for, as, as you said, for 17,000 years. There's a rock art painting here in Australia that is 17,000 years old that shows two lines of warriors, and they're chucking spears 
and uh, boomerangs at one another, <laughs> both hunting implements, harpoons they're throwing. So they're obviously disputing over some kind of subsistence issue. And, and you go forward all through history, people have been fighting over the land to produce the food, the water to produce the food, and so on, uh, trying to get control. If we go into recent history, World War II, the, the mainspring of the, the German uh, war effort, uh, it, it's it, the major military objective of Hitler's regime was Lebensraum. They wanted to take all that farmland off the Russians, off the Soviet Union, and convert it to German farmland. Um, the Japanese, likewise, were in Manchuria, and uh, and they went into China um, because they wanted the the land and the resources that it presented. They they talked about moving a million Japanese farmers uh, into into uh, Manchuria. Uh, so th there are these huge movements, even behind World War II, that drive us into conflict with one another. Now, the risk in future is that if our food supplies become insecure, and they are becoming insecure, we will end up in exactly the same place, fighting over over the uh, you know the, the 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 slender resources, because we're now in a position where humanity as a whole is demanding more and more food. Well, like there's twenty billion meals served every single day now. By the mid-century, that's going to be 30 billion meals. And the resources to produce those meals are running out. The most devastating item on the planet is not a nuclear bomb, it's your jawbone. <laughs> Human jawbone is eating through the planet at a phenomenal rate, dislodging billions of tonnes of topsoil, uh, devouring nutrients, wasting nutrients, um, destroying waterways, lakes, rivers, the, the whole lot. Now, if we keep on doing that, the current system of food production we've got will collapse. And uh, we're, we're going to talk about what, what that would look like uh, as we move deeper into the 21st century. But before we move ahead towards, you know, closer to 2050 and 2060 and those uh, really scary years, Let's take a look uh, today. Where are we today? You you mention in your book, uh, you say this. the book lists seven powder keg regions of the earth, regions harboring the majority of the human population in which water and soil resources are running out and food supplies are increasingly stressed in the face of insatiable population and economic demands. So I, I'm going to take a wild guess. Uh, just off the top of my head, China, India, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm, I'm going to come up with four, and you're going to say whether I got those four right, and you're going to tell us the other three. What are the seven powder keg regions of the earth? facing food shortages right now in 2019. Well, you're right on the money there, Sam. In all of those regions, they're, they're very close to water running out. And you can't grow food if you haven't got enough water. So it's basically a combination of drought, water mismanagement, and the growth of the megacities, because the megacities are taking the farmer's water away from them. So the water can't be in two places at once. It can't be, you know, in your, in your city shower and at the same time growing food for you on the farm. So there's this essential conflict in big countries like China and India, where there's a combined population of 3 billion people. Uh, and they really are on a knife edge. The Chinese economy, uh, its future, its entire future, depends on whether China's got enough water. And there are signs that they don't. And that's why they're going out around the world, buying up farms in other countries, because they know they can't feed themselves. Uh, India is much closer to being a basket case. You're absolutely spot on there. There's a very real danger that if North Africa runs out of money and so, uh, water, sorry, and if Sub-Saharan Africa runs out of water, there will be a huge migration into Europe. Hundreds of millions of Africans will be leaving Africa to go live in Spain, Italy and Greece. And that, those countries will just disappear. And consequently, Europe will disintegrate. As we saw what happened when a million um, Syrian uh, uh, refugees went there and caused absolute chaos. So uh, uh, another area that is a hot spot that not many people talk about is Central Asia. So the six Stan countries are all critically short of water. 
they're all running out of the water that comes from the from the glaciers on the high mountains that surround them. Uh, so then they're unable to feed their people. The, the Middle East, yes, the Middle East is, is a basket case already. But what people don't know about the Middle East is that the population of the Middle East is due to double to 600 million people. And already they are the most water scarce um, area on Earth. They're armed to the teeth. They're ready to fight over oil or anything else. So, you know, they're, they're a real powder keg region. But let me just say that this is not just in these regions of the world that are vulnerable. I mean, in the United States, the most technologically advanced country in the world, you're already short of water. Well, I only uh, counted you know, five in your list. Is the United States uh, coming in at number six or seven? Yeah, I, 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 listed, I used to list the United States as, as number seven simply because it's an example of a high-tech country that is mismanaging its water. Okay. Half of America's water comes out of the ground, and that groundwater is running out. Uh, I mean, the, those Central American, uh, mid -Amer uh, Midwestern aquifers, uh, they're half empty now, and uh, they're, they're not being replenished. It's going to take 6,000 years to replenish them. So, you know, there are a whole lot of uh, areas of America, including cities. Uh, many cities are going to be short of water. Cities that depend on groundwater uh, are going to run short. So, so even in, in America, I'm not saying it'll end up as a shooting war, but I am saying there, there is conflict arising now over, over water in America. So you've got all the disputes over the pipelines, which are really disputes over water and whether it gets polluted or not. You've got places like Flint, Michigan and things like that where water is being polluted to the point of undrinkability. So even in a great country like America, um, the water crisis is starting to manifest itself, and some rethinking needs to be done about how water is used. Okay, I, I, I think that, that I missed number six. I, I haven't heard Latin America and, of course, your own country uh, have, have not placed on the list. Or Well, I, so I would certainly put Latin America on the list. Um, you know, you've got countries like Chile and Peru where the, the Andean glaciers are disappearing. And those glaciers feed the rivers that feed big cities like Santiago and so on. So you've got critical water shortages emerging throughout Latin America. And it, it, it's a combination of different things. Like in places like Colombia, um, you know, you've got drought in the, in, in, the, in the high areas and you've got floods on the coast yeah. due to climate change. So there's sort of combinations of, of, of water crises. But you're already starting to feel the migratory pressure coming out of Central and Latin America. Um, that's why Trump is going on about a border fence. Believe you me, that is going to get much, much worse as the century advances. Now you've got Bolsonaro burning up the Amazon. If you burn up the Amazon, what you get is drought, okay, because the trees aren't there to recycle the local water any longer and create rainfall. So Bolsonaro is creating a desert in the middle of one of the world's dampest countries. So, you know, there are things like that, and that's going to spew people out sooner or later. There are going to be climate and water refugees going in all directions. Sao Paulo nearly ran out of water a year or two ago. So we're already seeing huge cities that are at critical risk uh, at the moment. You mentioned Australia. Look, we're already in deep trouble over water. Um, you know, our rivers in the, in, in, the, in the western part of the eastern states uh, are empty, absolutely empty. The fish are all dead. There have been horrendous scenes on the television. We've mismanaged our water extremely badly. We've allocated it. We've sold it to rich uh, irrigation farmers. And we've basically destroyed the resource instead of husbanding it. So we're in for a lot of trouble as well. Well, we're 13 minutes into this, and, and all we've been talking about is, is, it sounds to me like, the global water crisis, which is, I'm assuming what you're saying is, obviously, you cannot talk about a global food crisis without talking about uh, the global water crisis, because without water, there is no food or with too much water, I guess, in some cases, like here in the well, U.S. earlier this year. 40% of the world's food is grown on irrigation, okay? So the water has to be taken out of a river or a lake somewhere and put on the field to grow the food. By the mid-century, that's going to be 60% of the world's food. So the food in New York, the food in London or Paris or Moscow is going to actually require irrigation. If the water is not there to irrigate the farmer's fields, the food is not going to be there either. So water is the first most critical problem. But then there's the soil problem. 
So the, so the water crisis is going to hit in the next 10 years. The, the soil problem is going to make itself felt from about the 2030s and 40s onwards. But basically, we're wasting, uh, we're, we're losing 75 billion tonnes of topsoil every single year. That's 1% of the farmed area of the planet is, is turned to desert every single year. And at that rate, we're going to cut by 50% the area that is farmed worldwide. So we're actually going to reduce the farmed area. Unless we double food production on what's left, which seems very unlikely under climate change, you know, it's going to be very, very hard to farm in, in the 2050s and beyond then. Then you can add the climate change. That's the third factor. The biggest impact on humanity uh, from climate change is going to be food. And it's not going to be what people think. It's not going to be because it's too hot or even necessarily because of drought and flood. It's going to be the choppiness of the climate. When you pump more energy into the atmosphere, what you get is a much more violent climate. Now, a small scale example of that is a hurricane, like the one that has just wiped out the Bahamas. But the big scale thing is, it, it, the big scale climate impact is that it becomes much more difficult to farm because you're going from drought to flood to drought to flood yeah. in a much shorter space of time. And there isn't time to grow a crop. So, so you know, by mid-century, agriculture is going to become incredibly vulnerable to these chopping and changing of the climate. So you, and that's going to manifest you, you itself do, in food shortages. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm surprised to hear it. I just automatically assumed that you were going to say just, just the flat-out temperature that... Uh, he, you know that 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 once what is it tomatoes once uh, above 85 degrees Fahrenheit that the nightshades stop producing and then you can probably draw these these temperature limits to so many uh, of the different crops that at a certain upper limit plants just simply curl up and die and stop producing food so you do not see that. Where, where do you, just purely the heat waves? Well, yes, the, the heat waves are a major factor, um, particularly for certain kinds of crops. Um, the most vulnerable crop on the planet is rice. And rice, as you know, feeds about two or three billion people. So um, if you take the temperature up, I think it's to 40 degrees for two or three days in a row, yeah. um, the rice crop just ceases to flower. It, it, the, 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 the anthers of the rice plants die and no rice seeds are born. So you sterilise the entire rice crop if you get a run of hot days. So that's one of the major risks. Now, scientists say, oh, we can probably breed in you know, more resilient rices and things like that. But I'm not holding my breath because, you know, the next thing, after your three days of heat, you may well then get a flood or a drought or something else. So this is the point about climate change. It's a, it, it's a massive impact from different directions, affecting these open air growing systems. And this leads us to a conclusion that if we rely on the Bronze Age system of food production, which we've had for the last 7,000 years, to feed 10 billion people on a hot planet in the 21st century, we're going to be severely disappointed. Right? We've got to remember this system of, of food production has not changed in 7,000 years, except that we've added a few chemicals and some machines. It's still essentially the large-scale, open-air, broad-acre food production, cultivation of plants, right? If, if that fails, then the food supply fails. So we have to discover new ways to produce food that don't involve climate. Yeah, I was going, you, you kind of beat me to it. I was just going to read this, uh, this sentence from the, this essay. This is, I, I'm, we're kind of following this essay, guys, that I read the, the entire essay verbatim uh, a few days ago, uh, but I just want I, I just want to pull out this one sentence and get you to take a run on this for a while because I know my audience is is very interested in this whole subject. The same global food system that fed two and a half billion people in the mid twentieth century. Um, blah, 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 cannot meet the needs of 10 billion people living on a hot planet in the mid-21st. It is simply unsustainable. What, what I'm reading 
into that and tell me if I'm reading too much into it is that what, what I'm hearing is a, a population increase of 400 percent. There, there's obviously we cannot we cannot have a discussion about food insecurity and or water insecurity without talking about overpopulation. So are you willing to, uh, unlike so many others, are you willing to tread there and, and state for the record that there is a link between too many people, too many mouths to feed and, and too, little, too little food and water to feed them? Oh, absolutely. Look, as a young agricultural journalist, when I used to drive around the rural areas of Australia, you'd often run into a, a, a huge bloody swarm of locusts. It was like someone threw some eggs at your windscreen. You know, tens of millions of insects would fill the sky. Now, a lo we know what happens with a local locust plague. It ar arises, it eats everything out of house of ho home, and then it crashes. Now, the human population is a biological phenomenon, just like a locust population, just like a lemming population, like any other spike population that spikes. And if we do not manage the human population down, it is going to crash, just like every other biological population since time began, once it outruns its resources. Now, the warning I'm giving is that humans, with their current systems of production and feeding themselves, are running out of, of resources. So I'm saying if we don't want to crash, yes, we have to manage the population down. But... In the meantime, we have to buy time for that to happen because that cannot happen overnight. You can't get the human population down in much under a hundred years. That's well, how long it's well been. Mother Nature might argue with you uh, with you on that, Julian. But uh, I, I know what you're saying. You, you, you mean you mean voluntarily to uh, to put the the brakes on it. I, I want to read just start directly out of your book uh, the, the, this paragraph and and get you to uh, expound on it a little bit you, you were you were talking about china was was your lead in to this paragraph humanity as a whole is now now meaning i guess in 2019 in a position parallel to that of china with a total population whose demands including food far exceed the long-term ability of the earth to sustain them, at least under the present systems of production. This is not merely a matter of population. Today, each human consumes 10 times the, <clears throat> 10 times more material goods, water, soil, timber, metals, energy, food, etc., then did their grandparents just a century ago, while those living in the richest countries consume six to ten times more resources than those in the poorest, factoring in a quadrupling in our numbers over the same period of time, which we just talked about, this means humans presently devour 40 times more stuff than we did just in the early in the early 20th century the combined volume of this consumption is now so vast and so great is our general ignorance of the long industrial chains that produce these goods that many people have difficulty in envisioning them we do not perceive the unavoidable nexus between food and conflict now bearing down on us at a shocking pace. That was that was a lot packed into uh, into one paragraph there, Julian Cribb. Uh, where where did all that come from, and what's the takeaway from from uh, from all of that? Well, I guess it came from a sense of frustration uh, over the population <laughs> debate, Sam. Um, I see a lot of people in very rich Western countries with very expansive lifestyles lecturing people in poor countries that they should have fewer kids. And everybody should have fewer kids is the short answer. <laughs> but if we want to avoid catastrophe, we have to avoid consuming so much or, better idea still, we have to build a circular economy where everything gets consumed over and over again. Um, 
if we keep on digging holes in the planet, whether it's for farming or for mining or keep on clearing forests, whatever, we're going to run out of planet quite quickly uh, at, at, at the, the, the rate of our population. So we have to get the population down, uh, and that's going to take a long time because, you know, life expectancy is increasing in practically every country except the United States at the moment. So, um, you know, people are living longer lives. So it doesn't matter how hard you put the brakes on, on, on childbirth. If people are living longer lives, the population is still tending to grow. So, you know, it's going to take a long time to reduce humans to a viable population. What I think is a viable population, based on the science I've read, is around about the two and a half billion humans who were alive at the, at the time I was born. Right? That is a sustainable population, provided its resource consumption isn't too high. But the trouble is, as I say, it's, it's the amount of stuff that we use, that we consume, that we eat, that we spew out, that we pollute with, that is the real cause of the problem. It's our very inefficient um, production and, and, and waste disposal chains that we've got at the moment. Build a circular economy and you are halfway to solving the problem. But, but uh, you know, we could, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and get in, into a debate with Julian Cribb because I would probably be, be, be creamed. But I, I'm just thinking as you were talking, just, just the recycling on this planet has gone into complete shambles. We, the, re, the, particularly the plastic recycling crisis that is a getting a little bit of attention that uh, we're, we're, we're actually, it sounds to me like, recycling a lot m less than we were a couple of years ago since China and Asia is putting the brakes on it. And, and I'm hearing uh, reports, predictions that we're going to be producing four times the amount of plastic by the year, four times by the year 2050. I mean, just taking this one, this one example, Julian, and and and, and trying to look at the, the, the circular economy in, in a realistic light. That there, there's room for pessimism. Yeah, there's room for pessimism. There's also room for optimism. But what you're looking at there is a very frightened oil industry. Uh, the, the oil industry is terrified it's going to lose its market for selling gas to motor cars, okay, because all these electric vehicles and buses and trucks and everything are appearing all over the world. And it's true, within 20 or 30 years, electric vehicles will probably re replace the internal combustion engine. So the oil industry has got to find somewhere to sell its product. And they're focusing on plastics and other value-added things. Unfortunately, they're not focusing on recyclable plastics, particularly strongly at the moment, because they're not hearing a strong enough market signal to do that. But we can all send them a much stronger market signal by refusing to buy water in plastic bottles, by refusing to buy things that are wrapped in plastic. I mean, just as paper bags are coming back into supermarkets and things like that now, consumers have a lot of clout in this regard. And I think it's up to us as individuals to send the economic signals to the big oil majors and, and the big manufacturers, that we don't want dirty, polluting wrappers with our food and, and things like that. We want a clean society that reuses these things. But let me add one more thing. I, I'm predicting uh, later on that a huge future for our aquaculture. Part of that is growing algae. I, I, I wanna, I, 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 if, if we can just put this on hold for just a few minutes and uh, because... Uh, I, I, I'm just following a pattern. We have time to uh, to get to it. So before, if if you don't mind, can yep, we yep, can we yep. hold off for for just a couple of minutes? Uh, I, I'm kind of following the template of this uh, of this excellent essay. One thing that I want to uh, we're we're not going to have time to get to everything, but before we before we make the turn in this conversation but one thing that i do want to that i do want to talk about briefly is it's something that i admit while well, reading this and and uh reading as much of your book as i had time to as i had time to do uh is the is the links between food insecurity and and nuclear confrontation you know you're saying the name of your book is food or war now this isn't something 
th that an average person would see any connection between food insecurity and, and possible nuclear war and the flip side, uh, the way nuclear war could impact food security. So let's talk a few minutes uh, uh, about these connections between food and war, particularly in the nuclear age, and then we're going to move over to uh, what we can do about it. So give a run on your title, Food or War, what are you talking about? Well, basically, where, where a country or a society runs out of food, you end up with a civil war or even an international war. Um, and, and there are lots of examples of that. Syria is a classic example. Uh, there are about 12 um, food-based wars going on in Africa right, right as we speak. Uh, so, there, you know, where countries run really short of, of, of food, land and water, people get angry with the government. They rip the government down. Rebel movements start up, private armies, you name it. You have a, a conflict on your hands. Um, the big players, the Russians, the Americans, the Chinese get involved and sell everybody guns and the whole thing blows up. The critical risk is that some of those wars could potentially go nuclear. And I'll give you two possible examples. The first one is between India and Pakistan. Now there is a rising tension over the waters of the Indus River, which are filled by the, the disappearing glaciers of, of the Himalaya and the Hindu Kush. Now those glaciers are shrinking, so the water that goes into those rivers, which goes into the food supply, uh, to feed 1.3 billion people, um, they're disappearing. And Pakistan and India are getting more and more angry with one another over this. They're both nuclear armed, um, but between them, they've got about, uh, I think it's about 500 nuclear warheads. Now, let's suppose they had a small confrontation. Let's suppose they let off between 50 and 100 battlefield nukes, about the size of the Hiroshima bomb. Okay, well... What that would do is it would push enough dust and smoke into the atmosphere to actually chill the planet temporarily for about 10 years, 10, 15 years, by about two degrees. So your actual, your harvests in America, in China, in Russia, all around the world would be cut drastically by a sudden cold snap, by, by something akin to the European little, little Ice Age back in the 18th century. So this wouldn't last a long time, but it, it, it would cause mass starvation. If you suddenly cut the world's bread supply in half, uh, you know, people would feel that in every country on earth because the bread price is a universal price, uh, the wheat prices. So everybody pays the same for their wheat, basically. So, so the, the danger is that if Pakistan and India, you know, lose it and, and they go nuclear, um, then everybody is going to be affected by that. We're going to see hunger, even in countries that think they're safe. Uh, that's the first one. The other one that has been raised uh, by an American strategic think tank is the possibility that if the water supply in the north of China gives out, and there is a strong danger that it may, then you're going to see three or 400 million Chinese migrate. And most of those will probably go north into Siberia. So what is the Russian response going to be to Siberia, which has a population not much larger than New York City, uh, of, of 300 million Chinese migrants. Uh, it could well be a nuclear response. Yeah. We don't know. We just don't know. Uh, so, you know, there are these kinds of instabilities that are now building up in world geopolitics, and they are so easily solved. They are solved by developing a sustainable food supply. Okay, so we will uh, we we will now uh, switch switch the tone uh, of this conversation, and, and and again, I want to make an amplification and clarification, guys, because we're now go going to move in af after all of this build up. Uh, Julian Cribb is going to give us his ideas on what we're going to do about this, and. I am not going to get in a in a debate with Julian Cribb again over his over what he's getting ready to say or, or, over his uh, optimism or whatever word you want to use. A large part of our previous interview, if you recall, Julian, we we I mean for like twenty minutes of that interview, we discussed this the, the, this basic divide between 
what I call the doomers and the apocaloptimists. And so before either side, this, this shuts us down. I really want uh, anybody, j just as an amplification and clarification, you really need to listen to our previous interview. I will put the link to it and we, and we have this discussion. And so I just want to, to get people to chill out from, from this point forward. I, I know the crowd you're playing to, Julian, and I'm, and I'm just trying to get them to be nice. So uh, anyway, I'm going to read this, this one paragraph, and then you're going to take a tear uh, off on how we're going to change this. So anyway, here is where your essay takes a turn, hopefully, for a brighter future. Okay. These stark facts, what we've been talking about for 35 minutes, constitute an irrefutable argument to change our old food system, which you said, what, goes back 7,000 years, in favor of a new one, one that can withstand the blows of a changing climate, which uses far fewer natural, fewer natural resources to produce and which constantly recycles those it does use. In food or war, I describe a food system for the future and the profound benefits it can deliver not only to food security but also to world peace, human equity, preventing extinction, and helping to slow climate change. Um, it must ease climate change, reduce the threat of war, regenerate the natural world, nourish all of humanity, cleanse our polluted planet, improve our health and well-being, and more besides. It is a tall order, but it is achievable. So here, here's your platform. Uh, Julian Cribb to, con to convince the doomers in the crowd that this tall order is indeed achievable. How are we going to tackle this juggernaut? Well, well first, Sam, I would like to eschew the term apocaloptimist. I'm not an optimist. I think that optimists who base themselves without the facts uh, are basically a fairly gormless um, subset of human beings. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're no different to people who take dope to get through the day. Um, they're, 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 not, they're, not, they're not relating to the real world. Uh, there is grounds for optimism in the technologies and the systems that we have that we can improve to reduce the threats. But that doesn't mean to say that everyone's going to get away with this. We're not. There's going to be some horrendous damage done. Uh, to humanity that just it's just a question of how many people how many people suffer and die as a result of our mismanagement of and our fellow humans how many of our fellow humans suffer and die along along with us but anyway i'm just throwing that in oh okay Correct. so uh, i with, with with that uh disclaimer and again guys you can go hear more of this line of talk in our previous interview so so dive into it uh we've got 20 minutes left to how we're going to what what you mentioned three pillars uh the the three prong three pillar pronged approach to tackling the food crisis so just right well go all down around there. the world i am meeting farmers who are trying to reinvent agriculture they're trying to get off this this god-awful um engineered supermarket treadmill of producing industrial products by mining their soils and their water and their landscapes. They are trying to come up with a thing called regenerative farmer, farming that regenerates the soils, that puts back the trees, the grasses, the wild, um, the, the environment that, that actually contains and sustains agriculture. So there are farmers trying to reinvent how farming is done all around the world. Famous American example is Joel Salatin, but there are lots, lots more. Um, and I mean, there are literally tens of thousands of these people and they're working very hard, and they, some of them have got scientific backing as well. So we're going to have in the future a regenerative agriculture, but the products that it's going to produce are going to be very high-priced and very good quality. So the beef from a regenerative farm is going to cost you twice as much as the beef from a farm that destroys its resources. 
So you're going to have to pay. As a consumer, you're going to have to pay for a sustainable product, a sustainable food product. To help these farmers do what is right by nature and keep their farm, their farming system alive. Secondly, cities around the world throw away a vast quantity of nutrients and water. They either chuck a third of their food into landfill or else they send it down the sewer pipe into the river or the ocean. And that's all those nutrients that are lost are the things we, we desperately need to keep humans alive. If we capture those nutrients, and we can do it very easily, and recycle them into farming or food producing systems of different kinds, into algae farms, into biocultures and things like that, cities can supply up to a third, if not a half, of the world's food. At the moment, no city on earth can feed itself. However, if, as I say, cities go into this intensive food, modern intensive food production systems, we using recycled water and recycled nutrients, New York, London, Paris, Moscow, they can feed themselves, Shanghai. All of these cities can do it. They just need to, to recapture their nutrients, basically. By recapturing about, their, their nutrients, you mean fertilizing with, with human sewage, which, which, is, which I see happening even in, in Austin, Texas, where I come from. There's this thing called the yuck factor. Uh, so is, is that what you're talking? Like in Austin, I know they, they started a brand new program where restaurants just are not allowed to throw their food scraps away. It has to be in a separate and they're starting this giant compost bin uh, of all the restaurants and they ask homeowners just to put your food waste and they're starting a whole nother level. And so we got that and then I guess you're talking about reclaiming wastewater and, and uh, even solid human waste. Is what, that correct? What I'm talking about, what I'm talking about, Sam, is reclaiming the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, uh, the micronutrients, the, the copper, the zinc, the selenium, all of the tiny things that go to keep you alive. I'm talking about reclaiming them from the waste stream and then using them to feed algae, to feed insects, to feed chickens, to feed pigs, you know, so all the way up the food chain. Now, everything you've ever eaten consists of the broken down sewage of past generations yeah, of human yeah. beings. So, so let's not get coy about this. Uh, I mean, basically, the nitrogen and the phosphorus uh, in, in circulation on the planet have been through other animals uh, countless times since, since the Earth was formed. But I'm talking about reducing them to their elemental chemistry and then using that chemistry to feed, say, a bioculture. So the, these, these new and controversial um, meat alternatives and things like that. So, you know, that can be done quite easily. Technically, it's feasible. Economically, there's a question mark. Okay, now I, 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 I'm, I'm reading along as we're going. I, you, you skipped over a, a point in, in the first one when you were talking about regenerative farming. I'm not sure why it was lumped in, but I wanted, can you d just briefly you say uh, about rewilding a third of our present farmed area to end the sixth extinction. Now, now there's a tall order. Uh, tell us what you're referring to with this rewilding of one third of our present farmland. Okay, well, a world famous American biologist, E.O. Wilson at Harvard, says that if we want to save most of the species on the planet that are now being lost, we need to rewild half the earth. We need to turn it back into forests and grasslands and, and woodlands, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, while agriculture remains in its current condition, that's never going to happen. In fact, in, the, in Brazil, you can see a classic example of people destroying the wilderness in order to plant soya beans or something, or graze cattle. And that's just crazy. We can produce all of the, all of the, the, the nutrients, all the food we need, without chopping down the Amazon. So if we actually rewild all the, all the areas of the world that are not particularly good for agriculture, uh, you can actually create uh, a, an enormous wilderness that will preserve at least 86% of the species that we are currently exterminating. That's E.O. Wilson's argument. What I've added to his argument is to show how this can be done by, re by, by 
just simply withdrawing agriculture from the regions where it's not sensible to farm uh, and making agriculture regenerative instead, but also growing more food in our cities and particularly more food in the deep oceans. So my food supply has, has three dimensions to it. One, regenerative farming. Two, urban food production. And three, deep ocean aquaculture. Those three will make up the future mm -hmm. food supply. Now, give the us the food... subtle difference between deep ocean and intensive coastal aqua. Now, we, we need to be very careful here. Are, are you supporting so many uh, uh, of these fish farms? Uh, who was it? Denmark just said, announced last week that we're getting out of the fish farming business, that, it, that after doing it, it's clear that there's more environmental costs than there are benefits. Are, is there a line between the deep water versus the, the more shallow water at coastal areas? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Denmark only has shallow water. It doesn't have any deep ocean. So, so it makes a lot of sense for Denmark. Um, but there's nothing to stop Denmark farming the waters around Iceland or Greenland or something like that if, you know, if it became feasible to do so. Um, so the, the, the issue is this, ocean aquaculture is a very attractive thing because it happens in three dimensions, okay? A farm is a two-dimensional thing. It has length and breadth but no depth, okay? A huge net or whatever it is under the water, a huge cage in the oceans can be 100 metres deep as well as 100 metres wide or 100 metres long. So in other words, you can get a lot more fish in there, you can get a lot more livestock in there than you can get in one hectare of land um, on, on, on an ordinary farm. So, so first of all, starting to use the oceans more sensibly is going to take pressure off the land. That enables us to retreat from land-based agriculture in, phase, in favour of ocean-based aquaculture. Um, so that's going to relieve the pressure that is currently destroying the planet. Secondly, if you farm fish and other things in, in the deep oceans where currents dilute the, 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 the nutrient waste, um, then you don't have a pollution problem like you have in a Norwegian or a Scottish or a Danish field, basically. If you, if you put fish in a big net in a shallow water, uh, they will literally poo on the bottom until there's a huge pile of, of it and the whole place goes green. So you, know, you need to put them where the currents are strong. And this is going to happen. The second thing is we need to start farming water plants algae and seaweeds, because they're very good to eat, they're very good for feeding livestock, um, they, they, they've got tremendous other attributes, you can make oil out of them for your motor cars, you can make t-shirts out of them, you name it, you can make drugs out of them, you can make chemicals out of them, all sustainable things. So algae farming makes an awful lot of sense worldwide, but at the moment it's not very economical. So, you know, we, we need to go to the next stage of um, scale and growth and consumer demand. But basically, the future food supply has got to be somewhat climate proof. Uh, it's got to be, it's got to take advantage of areas of the planet where we currently do not extract much food, i.e. the deep oceans. Um, and it, it, it's basically got to do it in a way that does not pollute or destroy the ecosystem that it's in. And, and that's why the deep ocean aquaculture is different from this intensive fish farming that we're seeing today. Okay. Now, uh, again, I, 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 I don't want to, uh, to turn this into a debate, but I, I really like you, Julian, but for some reason I feel like I could be more, more upfront and honest with you than a lot of the, the guests. I, I don't know, you just make me feel comfortable that, that I'm talking with a very intelligent person who understands this. We talked earlier and, and, and this can be so many times when uh, when I'm when I'm reading something like this. We talked earlier about the links between overpopulation uh, and, and the double-headed snake of overconsumption, but the the demand side uh, that uh, that that all of the demand on all of these resources, yet all of these solutions that I'm hearing you talk about, and, and I hear this over and over and over again with these solutions, that 
P even people who mention that the problem is coming from the demand side, the solutions never seem to mention the number one, if the problem's coming from the, the demand side, why aren't we addressing the solution from the demand side, which is to reduce the number, in, in this case, the number of mouths to feed. Uh, that, you know, that, that, that po if population increase is causing the problem, then population decrease, it seems to me, it is this should be the number one pillar of any of these. So just take a run on why we don't see that in your pillars of solutions. Well, to be honest with you, because women are already doing it. Okay, forget the men. They've got nothing to do with this at all. Um, <laughs> well, women, have reduced, women have reduced their fertility from four and a half babies down to 2.4 babies in the last 40 years. Okay, so in almost every country on earth, barring a handful of African countries, the population is going down. In China, there is absolutely dramatic reduction in population that's taking place simply because women are making decisions not to have babies. Same in Japan, same in Switzerland. You know, it, it, it's a pretty much a universal trend. As countries come out of poverty and they acquire uh, Western living standards or close to it, they stop having kids. So economics is very important in driving this, but so are women having careers, education, opportunities to do other things than be barefoot and pregnant. Okay, so women have actually solved this problem, but to get the whole population down without actually killing people or seeing them die in some ghastly, you know, uh, starvation event, we're going to have to manage it down, and that's going to take really until about 2120. Okay, the, the human population is due to peak at current rates in around about the late 2060s. So the population will start to come down in the late 2060s at current rates, doing no more than is being done at the moment. Now, I am saying we can do more. Yes, we can bring more family planning into the third world. But that's not going to make much difference if the people in the first world are burning just as much fossil fuels, uh, digging up just as much metals, uh, laying waste the planet, uh, demanding more and more soya beans and what have you. So you're absolutely right, Sam. The person at the heart of all of this is you and me, the consumer. We have to send the demand for the sustainable as opposed to the unsustainable foods and other products. Just like we're expressing a demand for electric vehicles now, we need to express a demand for sustainable food from regenerative agriculture, from urban food systems, from uh, ocean aquaculture. So enlightened consumers are the absolute key to all of this. Okay, and, and I would love to keep where we are, but we, we are closing up. I have one more point before our closing uh, but before our closing comments, and I see my ba battery on my main camera is about to collapse on us. At the very end of your essay, I just want you to give us a couple of minutes to run on this, and then uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, this paragraph, though much of the world is complacent and supermarkets seem to bulge with food, it is often neither nutritious nor sustainable stocks could vanish in days if just-in-time systems were to be disrupted by war, energy crisis, or climatic events. No single megacity on Earth can feed itself. We are far closer to hunger than most of us suspect. Uh, is, is, does that even include the people uh, listening to this here in the United States, Europe, and Australia? Oh, indeed it does. I mean, we saw an entire section of Australia that was cut off by floods and the trucks couldn't get through and the supermarkets were empty in 24 hours. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that uh, New York during Superstorm Sandy um, experienced food shortages. So this system of, of bringing food from 2,000 miles away to feed a city is incredibly fragile and it needs to be replaced with a system where New York produces a lot of its own food locally. So it can never be starved, basically. It's absolute common sense. Take the waste nutrients and the waste water of New York 
turn them back into food, as lots and lots of people are doing. I mean, New York is a hotbed of innovation in food production now. That there's people, you know, growing sky farms and, and farms on top of restaurants and farms on top of hospitals. There's all sorts of clever ideas, you know, aquaculture, aquaponics, um, you know, all hydroponics, aeroponics, you name it, biocultures, all these things are happening in New York just as elsewhere. So there is a revolution afoot. And just everybody's aware that there's a clean green energy revolution going on and that the clean green energy is going to win in the end uh, and that the old energies, coal and what have you, are going to be pretty much washed up within 10, 20, 30 years' time. Now, the same thing has to happen in food, but it needs to be twice the size of the energy revolution. We need a global food revolution, the like of which we've never seen before. It's very exciting. There's a great opportunity for investors, for jobs. Uh, it's a terrific opportunity for chefs, for farmers, for all kinds of people, uh, and, and for people who just like eating food. So, you know, there's, there's a wonderful time ahead of us if we put our hearts and minds to this. Uh, and But unfortunately, I think we're going to get a few wake-up calls before that happens. I think you're right. So Julian Cribb, as you learned last time when I interviewed you, we got to make this real quick. If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, but you had the mainstream media getting you to sum up your new book, Food or War, in one minute, what would your summation to the mainstream media sound like? There is a major global food crisis building up. If we do not solve it, we will have war war all over the planet in different countries and it will affect everybody. If we do solve it, we will have peace, sustainability, opportunity and a greener um, a world with a brighter future generally. So it's worth solving. Okay, and with that folks, we have got to say goodbye once again to Julian Krebs. So this is going to be coming out on October 6th, so uh, your book is being officially released on October 3rd. Is that still the plan? That's right. Okay, so by the time you're hearing this interview, you will be able to find this uh, just in your usual booksellers. I hope so, or certainly on Amazon or uh from Cambridge University Press. Okay, and with that, folks, we have got to wrap this up. Julian Cribb, for the second time in 2019, we really appreciate you spending an hour of your busy life talking to us. Stick around for just a moment, but right now, I just want to say thank you very much for talking to us, and keep up the good fight, Julian Cribb. Thank you. Bye, guys.